I'm Harriet Vance Ball. I'm so excited to be here at ACC 2025 with my friend Roland Van Kimenad, who is a principal investigator and cardiologist at the Radbound University Medical Center. And he is here at ACC to present his trial, Liberal Fluid Intake versus Fluid Restriction and Chronic Heart Failure at the Late Breaking Clinical Trial Session. Welcome, Roland. Well, thank you, Harriet. Thanks for having me. Um, your trial answers a very practical question that many clinicians provide guidance to patients about. But often this guidance is not informed by high quality evidence. Tell us about the clinical context and the question that you started to answer with this trial. Well, uh, Harriet, uh, uh, you're indeed right. So uh, fluid restriction has been uh, recommended for decades in patients with heart failure with the idea that if you don't drink the water, you will not congest the water, uh, which is a, a, a simple um, thought, but um, there is no clinical evidence or whatsoever for that. And the ACC AJA guidelines uh, really uh, stated uh, spot on and state that uh, although fluid worker uh, restriction is recommended often, the amount of evidence is very low. And it's officially a gap of evidence in the uh, AHA ACC guidelines. So this uh, intrigued us to uh, look for the evidence, but also inspired by patients uh, um, who were uh, asking us why they um, were recommended the fluid restriction. Because for patients, actually, um, it's, it's a real pain. Um, and not only the fact that they are thirsty all day long, but also that they have to fill out lists and keep on track how much that they drink. And if you drink a cup of coffee extra with your spouse in the morning, you can't have a cup of tea with your friend in the afternoon. So these kind of things are also confronting you constantly with this disease, while the level of evidence is actually uh, was terribly low. So this is why we designed the, the, the Freshup study, looking at uh, uh, fluid restriction and liberal uh, fluid intake in chronic heart failure patients. So we randomized 504 patients. To, uh, uh, half of them had a fluid restriction of 1,500 mLs, and uh, half of the patients uh, had a liberal fluid intake. And our primary endpoint was quality of life, because uh, we thought that in this chronic population, this is actually what matters. So when we designed the study, I was actually not really interested in the amount of potential congestion, if you believe that this would cause congestion. But even if patients would feel better with an extra diuretic uh, per day, uh, I think that's still a benefit. And it's up to the patient to make the decision uh, how to proceed. So this is actually the background of our, of our study. Right. And this was a, an investigator-initiated multi-center trial in the Netherlands. Uh, and yes. you spoke about the allocation of the um, groups. Tell us about some of the methods. The primary uh, outcome was well defined. Were there any secondary and safety events that you captured? Yeah, exactly. So our primary endpoint was the KCCQ, which is, of course, an established uh, primary endpoint in heart failure studies. Uh, our key secondary endpoint was the third distress scale, probably not really familiar for most uh, clinicians. But to have an idea of the amount of thirst of the patients that the patient was suffering from. And we had a lot of secondary endpoints like anti pro BMP levels, uh, body mass, um, uh, amount of diuretics, hospitalization, mortality, etc. So, all kind of safety endpoints. So, what we did in our design so, patients were randomized to fluid restriction of liberal uptake during three months. And after that, you had an extra three months to look for the safety endpoints. So to make sure that patients during the three months of liberal uptake of fluid restriction did not suffer from safety endpoints after the three months. So, so we really wanted to pick up all, all events. And how did you assess fidelity to the intervention, adherence to the recommendation? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And we, we had a lot of uh, discussion about how to proceed. So uh, what we ultimately decided that uh, at week six, patients were asked to keep a lock and fill out how much that they drink in both arms. So mm -hmm. you can have a lot of discussion about that. I mean, 
in the end, a, a, a fluid restriction study in clinical practice will always be an open label. You can't do this in a double blind matter. But we decided to, to follow real life practice because you give an advice mm -hmm. to your patients and you have to believe your patients or you trust your patients that they will stick to it as much as they want. So this is why we, we did only one week of measurements. Uh, also, we decided to do it at week six in the midst of the, of the intervention period in both arms. Um, and um, because the fact that you have to keep track of your intake might be one of the factors that will um, interfere with your quality of life, we decided that we would do it in both arms only at week six. So not uh, constantly in, the, um, uh, in both arms because otherwise the, the liberal intake would also be constantly be uh, confronted with their intake and might even influence their intake. So this is why we wanted a really liberal intake in the, in the liberal arm. And this is why we decided to do it like this. Give us some highlights of the baseline characteristics, any major differences uh, in uptake of concomitant medical therapies and um, electrolytes or kidney function that you would like to share with us? Well, both baseline characteristics were well uh, randomized, so it's uh, mostly a male population. Um, um, average age was 69, and almost 80% of the patients were males, but um, it's, of course, also because we did have REF, have MREF, and have PEF. We wanted to look at the complete scale of heart failure patients, and they were all very well treated, so uh, more than 80 to 90% were on a RAS inhibition, had a beta blocker, um, and had an MRA, and almost 50 to 60% of the patient had an SGLT2. So the trial was initiated, the first patients were recruited in uh, May 21, so SGLT2 inhibitors were just coming up, and you can see that reflected in our, in our study population. Okay, so no no differences in any of the baseline characteristics. Um, were there, tell us about the kidney profile and the metabolic profile of the patients. Yeah, so we, uh, um, as an exclusion criteria, had a GFR below 30 ml per millimeter per 1.73 square meters. Um, and also a hypernatremia defined as a sodium level below 130 because in those patients, fluid restriction may be of benefit. So we did want to study that, and that was an exclusion criterion. Fantastic. Now tell us about your um, study results. Yes, well, so our results, so uh, our primary end point, uh, KCCQ, we looked at the difference in uh, KCCQ uh, after three months of fluid restriction or uh, a liberal uptake, and we found a difference of 2.17 points with a p-value of 0.056. So we did not reach a significance, um, although we were very close. Um, when we uh, look at the imputed data, so random imputed data, we had a p-value of 0.056, so still on the borderline. And if you look very closely to the patients, then you saw that in the patient group, which had fluid restriction, six patients uh, um, uh, terminated the study because they could not uh, stand the fluid restriction anymore. And they decided to completely stop and not fill out the questionnaire. So, Hypothetically, you can have an idea what would happen, what would have happened if they would have filled out the KCCQ uh, questionnaires. So we based our primary endpoints. This is, of course, um, not what we wanted. But looking at the baseline characteristics, what surprised us was that actually the patients were at a very high KCCQ level of uh, 72, while we powered on a KCCQ level of 66. So that means that these patients were actually in a very well condition. Uh, feeling very well and it's of course more difficult to improve if you're already doing well rather than you, when you feel miserable. So this is probably one of the, the factors that we did not uh, um, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, uh, expected, but this is something that, uh, that uh, had happened. And secondly, um, when we initiated the study, most of the patients actually in the Netherlands were on fluid restriction because there was no no recommendation. And you see that in our study, actually, so we expected that fluid restriction would be standard care. Um, however, in our study population, half of the patients were already on a liberal fluid uptake. 
So if you randomize someone from liberal fluid uptake again to a liberal fluid uptake, it's not to be expected that KCCQ will increase uh, dramatically. So these factors were, um, were of course, uh, not uh, anticipated. However, we, we uh, think that our study is still uh, telling you something. And with all these uh, caveats, uh, you can definitely see that in both arms, there were no significant difference in safety events. There were no increases in body weight. There were no changes in anti probin P. There were no uh, significant changes in diuretics, up titration or down titration. There were no differences in kidney events. There were no differences in mortality or hospitalization. So you can turn it the other way around. Um, if you read our study, do you feel that you should recommend fluid restriction in patients if you did not do it already? So, um, well, um, that's uh, that's our, that are our results. All right. So, first of all, the self-report uh, of patients at the six-week time point confirmed that they had adhered to the recommendation. And then, importantly, as you mentioned, there was no statistically significant difference in health status. And the numeric difference was under a clinically meaningful, important difference threshold, highlighting that um, a, a fluid restriction strategy, or at least guidance for fluid restriction, is not evidence-based. There's no evidence of any benefit. And potentially with the study withdrawals that you described, you know, there's concern that it could uh, impair potentially some of how patients feel or function such that they would not want to continue with fluid restriction. Is that correct? Yes. And, and uh, what I didn't mention is our key secondary endpoint, the third is scale. So we definitely found that patients with a fluid restriction felt more thirst and, and suffered more from thirst. So this is, I think, something uh, uh, we felt mentioning. And what I didn't mention also is the difference in intake. So the difference in intake was uh, uh, um, patients under fluid restriction regime had like 1,500 mLs, 1,480 millimeters on average, while the liberal uptake had uh, 284 mLs more. So that's 1,746. Uh, uh, so that's the difference is not really big, but they were think they were drinking. Uh, on uh, based on their thirst, so it is an older population. If you look at at uh, baseline statistics of these patients of, of these uh, patients with this age, that's actually what the pee patients drink normally. So they just drank as they felt like their thirst had to uh, they had to uh, uh, drink for. So so um, I think that's important that patient felt better, didn't feel thirsty, and the difference was uh, uh, not very big. Yeah, and I also wonder if, if um, you know, telling patients to restrict fluid influences their other nutritional intake. I know it's not something you, me uh, you measured in the study, but there might be other reasons why we might not want to restrict fluid. And important to keep in mind that none of these patients were hypo and atremic, so your results exactly. apply to patients with a normal sodium profile. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on your trial, which really highlights how a very focused, practical question can inform us and guide us in, in a very important way in how we care for patients with heart failure. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you. You're welcome.